Today is October 3, 2021. This is a Sunday edition of Wilderness Wanderings. It contains a scripture and sermon from our worship service at Emmanuel. You can find a link to the whole service on our website, emmanuelministries.ca. But for now, may God bless you as you hear his word. We are going to open scripture this morning again to the book of Revelation. We are going to be reading chapters 6 and 7, but we're going to do that in two halves. First, chapter 6, and then we'll, I'll say a few words about it, and then we'll read chapter 7. I'm going to invite you to stand in reverence for the Word of God, a tradition that we also picked up in the early days of COVID, that other parts of the Christian church have, uh, have shared with us. So John is seeing visions in heaven, and the main vision is of the Lamb on the throne, the throne of God. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Uh, There was a little scroll that was in heaven, and it had seven seals on it, and nobody was found to open the scroll except the Lamb. So I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown. And he rode out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! Then another horse came, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in in his hand. And then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? And each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. I watched. As he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned red blood. And the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs dropped from the fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They call to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. The land on which we worship is a traditional territory of the Houdanan Sea and Anishinaabeg nations. I probably didn't say that quite right. Within the lands that are protected by the dish with the one spoon Wampam belt agreement. As you know, this past week we celebrated, well, I'm not sure that's quite the right word. We at least observed the first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. And the reasons for that day are obvious, I hope. Not least among them, all the missing children, and before that, 
all the missing indigenous women and all the other horrors that preceded them. We have lived through 18 months of a pandemic. The toll that this has taken on the peoples of the world has not yet been tallied. Recently, the United States military left Afghanistan to be very quickly replaced by the Taliban. And most of us believe that to be bad news, especially for the women of Afghanistan. Of late, in the city of Hamilton, murder in broad daylight makes the news on a regular basis. This is just to mention very, very few of the things that are wrong with this world. Bad things happen right here and around the world. And I could spend lots of time with you this morning enumerating all of those evil things, but I think that you know them as well as I do, and some of you better than I do. But we are here, most of us anyways, as believers in Jesus Christ, and we believe that he came to establish the kingdom of God. And as he himself said, it was a kingdom of peace. And so this morning we ask the question, where is that kingdom? In the face of evil, evil that was even perpetrated by the very followers of Christ, where is the kingdom of God? And I dare to ask you this question, is it all a myth? Is the things that we believe just a hoax? Are we all deluded in our faith? The book of Revelation, Pastor Anthony and I believe, was written in the face of such questions. Jesus Christ, had inaugurated the kingdom of God. That's his claim. But the Roman armies were winning. The gospel that Jesus Christ brought to the world proclaimed that God loves this world and its people. But it just so happened that those who believed this were being imprisoned and killed on crosses. The followers of this Jesus believed that he had risen from the dead, but as they looked around, hell, the earth was going to hell in a handbasket. It seemed like it had made no difference at all. What about the kingdom of God? What about Christ's victory over death? What about his resurrection? Did it matter? It seems to us that those are the questions that the book of Revelation answers, addresses. Our chapter, chapter 6 and 7, is part of that story, part of that address. Chapter 6 is where the book begins to get really complicated. And the interpretations that you can find on chapter 6 and the following chapters are even more complicated than the stories themselves, the visions themselves. And I don't want to tell you about all of those different interpretations. I just want to give you the one that Anthony and I share. And it begins here. These are the opening words of the book of Revelation, the revelation from Jesus Christ. These are the words that the resurrected Lord gives to his church. But I think there's more. John hears a voice speaking. And when he finally turns around to see where the voice is coming from, what does he see? He sees Christ. It's not just a revelation from Christ. It is a revelation of Christ. This book is about Jesus. And I think if we remember that, 
we'll get a lot of it right. Also this, John is told, write there for what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The book of Revelation is not some kind of complicated uh, future story of the world that we have to sort of figure out. The book of Revelation is about the state of affairs as they are today, as they were in John's day and they still are today. They are simply visions, pictures of the world is like in between the times of Jesus' first and second coming. But at the heart of that story is this, the mystery of the seven stars. As soon as John is told to start writing about the times, this is what we are to remember. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And what does John see among the lampstands? Jesus Christ. The the visions in Revelation are meant to encourage the church, to remind them of Jesus' last words in Matthew, I am with you to the very end of the age. Chapter 5 begins this way, Then I saw a right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. The scroll is commonly understood to be sort of the writings of history, the history of the world, if you will. But they're locked up, they're sealed, and and no one can open the seal. And, And the interpretation that's given to that is simply this, that if no one can open the seals and read the history, then it's utter chaos, that nobody has control over it. And we have no idea how it's going to go where it's going to end. And John falls down and he weeps. So Pastor Anthony read us last week. He weeps and he weeps because he recognizes if no one can open the scroll, then we are doomed. But someone touches him on the shoulder and says, do not cry. Because there is one who can open the scroll. The lamb, the lion of Judah, the one as a slain. Revelation 6 is then a picture of human history. And human history is simply this, warfare. It's a bloodbath from beginning to end. But so that we do not get discouraged, the first seal is broken. And what do we see? I saw the first, I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. And I heard aloud, I heard one of the four living creatures saying, a voice like thunder, come. And I looked, there before me was a white horse. And its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown. And he rode out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. And one of the things that we have said about the book of Revelation is that you have to have read the other books of the Bible first. And somebody who will have read the other books will know of the one who rides a white horse. There is only one in the history of this Bible that rides a white horse. And that's our God. That's Jesus. And he will show up again at the very end of Revelation in chapter 19 as the one who has conquered And so as history unfolds, the first rider is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He holds history in his hands. When we begin to look at history, we do not look at history from the perspective of fear. We do not, first of all, see chaos, and we do not even, first of all, see warfare. But the first thing we see is our Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at the world in which we live, John invites us with eyes of faith 
to see the lamb who was slain riding on the white horse, the conqueror, the one who wears the crown. We are followers of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth. He went around and he healed the sick. And he gave encouragement to the downtrodden. And he fed the poor and the hungry. He gave water to the thirsty. And he raised the dead. So, do we then have to change our way of life and leave behind the Jesus of Nazareth and follow this rider on his horse with a bow, with the weapons of war? Now, that's what John intends. John intends us to understand this. And to give some food to the hungry and some water to the thirsty, and to walk with someone who's broken down, to pray with those who are sick, to lift up the discouraged. It seems like so little in the face of all the evil of the world. It seems like so little in face of all the hunger and thirst and pain that's in this world. But when we see the rider on the white horse, what this rider says, my way wins. My way wins. And so he calls us to keep offering the cup of cold water and the loaf of bread and the healing hand and the words of encouragement. In the face of all the evil of the world and all the warfare and bloodshed around us, the way of compassion and peace will win the way, win the day. And in the face, in the face of that white rider on the horse is all the evil of the world, all the warfare. And I think maybe James puts it best. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Doesn't that begin in the family living room? The siblings over the same toy? Isn't it sometimes between spouses? between neighbors, even between Christians of different congregations, and eventually between provinces and countries and nations. We want what we don't have, and so we fight for it, killing others along the way. The red horse that John sees is bloody and cruel, makes life miserable and horror. It is evil. Then the black horse comes. The black horse speaks of economic injustice. It has a scale. And these words are said, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and the wine. A little bit of investigation into ancient economics makes us understand what that means. What it means is that it's really hard for the day laborer to buy enough bread for his family. The price of wheat is just too high. But oil and wine are luxuries that the rich have in abundance. It speaks to the realities of the world in which we live, where there are so many who have too much and way more who have too little. There is starvation and gluttony that live side by side in this world. Greed. Human greed. 
And then a third horse comes, or a fourth horse, sorry, pale horse of sickness. I won't tally all the sicknesses that we endure. But I wonder if it's more than just the sicknesses like COVID and cancer and heart attacks and diabetes. I wonder if the pale horse isn't also trying to apply something about the way that we live in this world. Where we sit way too much, and so our bodies become weak. We eat way too much unhealthy food, and so our bodies, though bloated, are undernourished. We spend way too much time in front of screens. Bill Gates said in the 1980s that the goal of Microsoft was to get a computer in every house and on every desk. I think he accomplished it, at least in North America. But what has the cost been? Drug companies that make drugs to keep our unhealthy bodies functioning are some of the richest companies in the world. Think about that. The irony that making people better makes so much money for so few. The horsemen are brought out on the field of battle. There's more. The evil of persecution, the fifth seal, suffered by the minority who live by faith. They are afflicted because they identify as God's people and it costs them their lives. They cry out, how long? There are natural catastrophes of all kinds and animals and peoples respond. They quail in the face of evil, but also because they begin to understand that they are to blame. And judgment is coming. And the question, chapter 6, ends. Who can stand? In the face of evil and the judgment of God that is coming upon humanity for what we have done to the world, who can stand? It comes and it feels like a rhetorical question, like a question that's not really expected to be answered. And yet an answer comes. Before the final seal of history is opened, we pause to read the answer. And so I invite you to stand so we can read chapter 7. After this, I saw four, that is, after the question, who can stand? I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called out with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulon. 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph and 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number 
from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels are standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Would you join me? Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them in his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. You may be seated. The question is, who can stand in the face of the evil on this earth and against the wrath of our God that is coming? And the first image that we see are angels, and they are holding back the destruction of the earth, the four winds that are going to blow and bring destruction. And they are told to wait until the number of the chosen have been sealed. We have a list of all the tribes of Israel, 12,000 of each of them, so 144,000. And then we see an image of a great multitude. And I think the point is very clear, that that great multitude is those 144,000. And it's not a literal 144,000. That is a number in the Bible of 12 and 1,000, a number of completion and fullness. And so the great crowd around the throne are those who can stand. And who are those? Well, those are the ones who are sealed, who have received the seal of God. Now again, in order to understand that, we need to know the rest of the book, books of the Bible. And as we re- read through the scriptures, we begin to understand. Here is sort of the culmination of that image of being sealed. And you, who's Paul addressing? He's addressing the church, those who are followers of Jesus Christ, those who believe that he is the Son of God raised from the dead. If you are that number, if you, are, if you believe that, then you are part of this number, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed. You were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance of the redemption until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if you believe in Jesus, then you are numbered among those who are sealed. You are those who can stand in the face of evil. Because you believe in the one who rides on the white horse. You believe in the one, the lamb, who is able to open the seals, who holds history in his hands, who is shielded by the very presence of God. Oh, the effects of evil we may still experience. We may still be involved in wars. We may still be sick. We still may be impoverished but we are protected because evil, evil at its very heart separates us from God. And the seal of the Holy Spirit says that we can never, ever be separated from God. That the word of Jesus is true, that I am with you always to the very end of the age. Those of us who believe in Jesus We can look sickness in the face and say, my body may be worn out. 
I may be close to the grave, but there are limits to what you can do because I belong to Jesus Christ. And so how shall we stand in the face of evil and judgment? We face evil unafraid. For John also wrote this, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Our God is the conqueror of evil. Our lamb is though slain, now lives. He is the lion of Judah. This is the image of revelation. Our Lord is alive. He is greater than the one who is in this world. And so we may face all kinds of bloodshed, but we will not be afraid because our Lord is King. We live by faith. Faith is confidence of what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. What happens when you stub your toe and it hurts? You don't feel anything else in your body anymore, right? Because your toe hurts. Evil's like that. Everything in the past 18 months has been about COVID. It's all we can see. But the Bible invites us into the life of faith where we see beyond it. And we see that there is a greater truth that our Lord reigns. And he will, in the end, conquer those other riders on those other horses. That he wins. Evil is contained. It will not have the last word. The last word of the story is life. Resurrection. Christians are not afraid of death. Because we believe there is life after death. And so we can face it. Because we know there's more to the story. How do we stand? We continue to follow, follow Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, peace be with you. This is the Christian orient in the face of all the evil and unrest of the world, we are people of peace. Let's start practicing that in the face of all the turmoil of our age. As the Father sent me, has sent me, I am sending you. Let us continue to do what Jesus did. Bring peace. And finally, we join those who are worshiping the Lamb on the throne. Notice, notice what happens in Revelation chapter 7. Revelation 6 is all this horrid, all this bloodshed, all this evil. The question is, who can stand? And John sees this multitude. We are among them. And what are they doing? They are worshiping the Lamb and the one who sits on the throne. We continue to worship. In the face of everything else, the church continues to worship. Because the church knows the end of the story. And when we worship, we bang on heaven's door and we say, Jesus, would you hurry up and make an end to this evil and bring life? We join the saints of heaven and earth through all time and space. And we worship the Lamb who is on the throne. That's how we stand. We see our God, our eyes of faith see our God. And we see that he is greater than everything that's happening in this world. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That is our song, no matter what happens on this earth. Amen. Lord Jesus, fill our hearts, fold the song, the songs of revelation that we may sing them in the face of all evil and we may live as people of peace 
with hope in this world. Amen. Thanks for listening in. I hope you'll join us again tomorrow as we continue our daily devotions and our wilderness wanderings. As you journey on into the week ahead, go with the blessing of God. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors.